Hello everyone and welcome back. In this and in the next episode, we learn how to work with core dumps. As we'll see, they are very useful to analyze application crashes. In this first part, we'll understand when and how to dump a core file on macOS. We'll investigate different scenarios because not all binaries will behave the same. Some will not create a core file unless specific kernel options are enabled. Before we get started, why even bother with core dumps? One typical scenario is vulnerability research and exploit development. During the fuzzy stage, we'll need a way to automatically find vulnerable points inside an application and triage them to see which ones are exploitable. Not all the crashes are exploitable and the core dumps can provide valuable information, like the values of the processor registries or which function calls have been taken to reach the crash. All this information is useful to manually retrace the execution of a program. So, how do we obtain a core dump in the first place then? I've created a simple application that tries to access element 1000 from the arguments array. Obviously, this will fail because we will not pass any arguments to the main function. The application should crash because it won't be able to read from that memory address, because element 1000 doesn't exist, and it should also generate a core dump. Let's see. Core files contain information about the current thread, the instructions executed by the thread, the reason it crashed, addresses of memory blocks, and so on. There's a lot of information there, and their size will be significant. Let's compile the code, run it, and see what happens. I'll name the binary very suggestively, drop core. Notice that we received a segmentation fault error, as we expected, but no core file is dumped. How do we know? There should have been a message specifying that a core file was dumped. We didn't get that. There are a few settings that we need to take care on macOS, and all of them are set via kernel parameters using sysctl tool. So let's see which flags we possibly need to enable that deal with core dumps. Use sysctl a to dump all, then do a grep search for the word core. The first match specifies the location of the core files, which should be in the cores folder, and the second one, kernel.coredump, is a flag. That one also needs to be enabled in order for applications to drop a core. Let's see how to use it using sysctl w for write. We specify the parameter and the value, which should be 1. We need sudo to do that, super user privileges. All right, run the app again. Hmm, still there is no, no crash dump file. As it turns out, there is another setting that we need to take care of, which is core size. We can see the current value using the ulimit command. Plus the minus C flag, the size at the moment is zero. Let's set this to unlimited. Core files can grow quite big. Let's review all the settings before proceeding. We can now run the binary again. It's taking a while now to finish. That's because it's actually writing a huge core file, which we will analyze in a few moments. Let's give it a bit of time to complete. See now that the message mentions a core being dumped. Let's check the cores folder. Notice it's almost two giga in size. This is the current one based on timestamp. We can use this file to see what's happening in the application. A 
at the moment of the crash. Before that, there is something else we need to cover. Some vulner vulnerabilities, like the one from the pseudo-exploit that was recently discovered, are more tricky. In that case, the application involved has the SUID bit set and runs with super user privileges. That case is a bit special because the system in general will not drop a core file after crashes. That's because its memory might contain sensitive information. So, what does it mean for an application to have the SUID uh, bit set? It signifies that the application runs with the privileges of the owner with higher privileges. Often, the owner is root. Let's see how to simulate a scenario involving a SUID app. I have another file that we're going to work with, but before, Let's think about what can happen if we simply copy the binary, remove the SUID flag, and execute it. This might work for some apps, but others, like sudo, will simply refuse to run as a different user. They will not run unless executed with the SUID bit uh, flag set or as root. Okay, so let's go back to this simple application, which simulates that scenario. I've added an instruction that will get the EUID, which is the effective user ID. If it's not root, it will exit. We will compile the second application and name it drop underscore core underscore root. We need to assign root as the owner to the application using the change owner command. Of course, we need sudo for this. And then we also need to add the suid bit using pluses. Let's check the parameters the flags. So, as you see here, the app is owned by root, but it can be executed by anyone. Notice also the S flag here. If you're curious, you can find online a deep dive on permissions flags. So when it executes, the effective user ID will be root. This is a very simplified case, but it works for our purpose. In real scenarios, the checks are much more complicated, but this is enough for our demonstration. So when we run this application, we'll pass our little check, we add it in the code. Usually, SUID programs execute some privileged tasks and then drop the privileges. So the application crashes as expected, but as we were saying, there is no core dump created because the program has the SUID bit and ran as root. The system considers this application sensitive and the crash dump could contain blocks from its memory. So, by default, no core will be dumped. Let's go back to the kernel parameters that we set before and check if there's anything that might help us to solve this situation. Hmm, there is something interesting here, a parameter called SUGID core dump. Most probably, this comes from an option to dump cores for both SUID and SGID applications. That means applications that have the set UID or set GID flag set for the group and user. So let's enable this parameter as well using sysctl-w. Remember, we're doing this for demonstration purposes and we already have pseudo privileges. In the normal cases, we won't be that fortunate. All right, and then let's run the application again. Now, it takes a bit of time to finish. 
This is a sign that it's writing the crash logs on the disk. Let's check the course directory. Notice now that the file was actually dropped by the root user and look at the permissions as well. They make sure that the user, the other users, for example, the current user, which has the ID 501, would not be able to read the core file, of course. Let's recap what we've done in this episode. We've created a simple application to generate a crash following an access to an invalid memory address. We've seen how to enable crash dumps generation by setting the corresponding kernel parameters. We've also seen how to do this for applications that have the SUID bit flag. Now that we know how to dump cores and understand the SUID bit, in the next part, we will use LLDB debugger to investigate those crashes. Thank you very much and don't forget to subscribe if you like this video. See you in the next episode.